pre-podcast conversations can get a little bit out of hand sometimes. That was just a mic check. Yep. The, the Singing mic the checks. four chord song. <laughs> Singing the four chord songs followed by an insane clown posse reference, but also making a pee joke. Yes. Man, it would have been great to catch that for the... We are we are too classy to uh, remember to hit to uh, hit record before, before all of that started. I mean, classy's a word for it. We are too dumb. That seems to be more accurate oh my gosh we've been we've been making a trend recently on the podcast Mm -hmm. of the joke sponsor we have if you look at the document at this time it's currently blank it's currently blank the joke sponsor not the entire doc i mean it it, it's a reflection of our own existence really no thoughts just vibes running in um, running almost exclusively upon vibes (sighs) it's been a week Indeed, it's always been a week. You had a, you had a wonderful. Uh, you had another tough mutter this weekend. You've been doing a lot of that this this season, as I do, as I'm known to do. I guess yeah, this year I've actually done more than usual. You have, you have, and it is that time of year where before it's like completely and utterly freezing and yep. miserable constantly. Yep, the big the last big event of the season is in is eight weeks. Eight weeks. Eight weeks. And you have how many between now and then? Maybe two. Hmm. I don't know. I'd have to look. Fascinating. Fascinating. All of that sounds completely miserable to me. It's great. Good I'm time. Sh- I'm sure it is perfectly fine. I've gotten to the age where I found that uh, if I if I have um, like compression knee braces, oh yeah, then the, then my day after the race, uh, followed by the rest of my life, is much better. Do I have I have found that the knee brace in most any physical activity is just a much better experience for. The elderly, like us. Yes, the old, old people. We're we're both staring down the barrel of 30 here pretty soon. Yep. We're going to have the barrel in our mouth very soon of 30. Yeah, yeah. My birthday is in uh, about a month. Yeah. I'll be 29. I'll be 29 in February. So. Take that, people. Is it weird to have a midlife crisis in your 20s? I mean, that would be, that would then just put the end of your life towards your 60s. <sighs> I mean, I'm probably not going to be able to retire anyway in this economy. Yeah, yeah. none of us will. At least not with Social Security. Anyway, this is episode 49 of the Dungeon Bros Podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And this is, it's been a while since we've said this, this is ostensibly a Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering podcast. Yes. But originally it just started as Dungeons and Dragons. Now we've added Magic the Gathering. There's so much more to talk about now. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like this is, podcast is just whatever we feel like talking about. And, unfor- and and maybe unfortunately it just centers around Wizards of the Coats products. Yeah. Yeah. We're not really into Lorcana. Uh, we're not re- I mean, we talk about we've talked about other games that we play. Sure. Just not we we just don't end up playing them very often. That's is cool. the thing. Yeah. Is the thing. Uh, this episode of the Dungeon Bird podcast, we want to we want to shout out our our corporate sponsor of the week. Uh, the corporate sponsor of course being um, the World Tree. The World Tree, yes. Yggdrasil itself. Uh, the the founding principle of of the multiverse mm-hmm. and the connection between uh, shout out to Yggdrasil uh, granting some boons to our most anger filled friends and granting them the power to uh, make big old vines and and wrap people up hentai style so thank you to Yggdrasil this week for sponsoring the podcast good Yggdrasil dot c a <laughs> <laughs> Yep, that's right. It's, it's the world tree. Product. Yep, the world tree has its domain in Canada. Oh, the taxes are probably worse. I don't know why it would do that. Uh, you know what? A lot of Canadians. A lot of. I mean, there's a lot. There's a whole part. Of there are the, there are Canadians. Uh, of yes. The Geneva Convention devoted to stop that Canada. Stop that Canada. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, as far as joke sponsors go, I feel like that was pretty good. Thanks for. For just kind of rolling into it, yeah, all right. Just completely roll. Literally, when I was I, as I was beginning the intro to the joke sponsor, I'm like, all right, I gotta pick something now. <laughs> <laughs> gotta figure it out. Improv, <laughs> improv, improv. Uh, the path of the world tree being one of the new subclasses for the barbarian. In- interestingly enough, also a card in Magic: The Gathering. Yeah. Path of the world tree, a perfectly all right card. Yeah. Makes two two bear eventually. It does. So that's that's pretty neat. Apparently, trees like bears, which I mean, that kind of checks out. See, I can't stand them; they're unbearable. Yeah, yeah. I like the right. It, it, we live in America. We do. 
and we've been granted some some set of rights Indeed. in America. Well, more like had it, the the philosophy, of course, being that our natural rights are being acknowledged by the government and protected by the government. Um, whether or not they've done a good job of that, no. But they've been collected into what is called a bill of rights. Indeed. Not 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 that not a bill that you'd be charged with, but the second one, of course, the right to bear arms. It's very interesting that they feel the need to protect our right to have the arms of bears. See, I, I've been on the uh, on the campaign path for a long time now for the right to arm bears. Mm-hmm. I think all bears should be given mm-hmm. M4s. It, it, they, they, would need to, they would need to make the triggers and the trigger guards a lot bigger because the paws. Yeah. And they, they, that, that's the main reason is that they've been having to like claw, like put a little claw in there and just hope that you know, it's... Bears not, are quite strong, could easily crush that sort yeah. of... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also protected in the right to bear arms is uh, the protection to be one of those like uh, aerobic dancers in the '90s, and then have leg warmers on your arms, thus making your arms oh, yeah. look bear-like. Yeah, or or if you strip those off, then you have bear arms again. Oh wow, I've got bear arms right now. You do? Yeah, I'm rocking the tank. Yeah, I'm also I'm working a cutoff, but I have it covered by a, a jacket that has use, our logo on it. Of course, the Dungeon Bros logo. You can get uh, Dungeon Bros merch. We actually have that. We never really talk about it. I was wearing the Dungeon Bros tank last night on the Monday Night Live stream for Magic where, the Gathering. Where people do not see our clothing in that nope. one. Nope. I should have worn this tank last night and then saved the Dungeon Bros tank for the podcast live stream where you can watch us on TikTok every other week on Tuesdays, usually at noon. Mm-hmm. Every other week when we record this podcast, as is a podcast that goes live every other week. Before I get into the spiel, though, we've we've waffled on enough. We have, we have, we have. Uh, we do want to mention at the top of the show a very big thing has happened in the world of Magic: The Gathering. Uh, Magic: The Gathering community is mourning Sheldon Mennery, uh, who has passed away. He's been battling cancer since 2016. If you do not know who Sheldon is, he's considered the godfather of Commander, which is Magic the Gathering's most popular format. His wife, Gretchen, announced on September 9th that her husband passed away peacefully following his battle with cancer. Quote, it is with great sadness and heavy hearts that we mourn the loss of dear friend and colleague Sheldon Mennery. That is from uh, Wizards of the Coast in a quote to Polygon. Perhaps one of his greatest contributions to the Magic community is through the Commander format, known by many as the, quote, Godfather of Commander. He was instrumental in the format's creation and development. As a founding member of the Commander Rules Committee, he oversaw the format's evolution into one of Magic the Gathering's most popular formats. It's the format that we got into Magic the Gathering that caused us to fall in love with it and spend... Way too much money. <clears throat> an, um, an amount of money. It is an amount. Uh... Obviously offering condolences to his wife and family and all of that is a sad day to be a fan of Magic the Gathering. There's been a lot of days that that you should be sad to be a Magic the Gathering fan just as a consumer of the product. But now it's just for the community. Yes. Yes. So rest in peace to Sheldon. We hardly knew you. Literally, we never met him. Yes. Also, quick sidebar here. Quick sidebar here. On, On Twitter. Yes. All of all of these all of these magic content cre- I haven't brought this up to you. All of these magic content creators on tic- on like tw- uh, Twitter X. Sorry, they uh, everyone had their like oh rest in peace all these things. But there were so many of them that were like though I didn't agree with your opinions on the format. I respect. It's like you don't have to say that. Yeah, like you can just be like. You, you could just be sad and grieving at the loss. Like you like Commander, you might not agree with his opinions on Commander, but like. It's not really relevant. Right. Just, it's not about you, guy. Yeah. It's about... As is most things in life. It's not about you. No. You're not that guy. You're not that guy, pal. You're not that guy. Anyway, this is, the, of course, we were just going to do a quick rundown of all the things. Of course, you can find the Dungeon Bros podcast every other week on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, etc., etc. Any podcast services around the globe. Round we'll the say. globe. It's also available on our YouTube channel. We have, of course, the TikTok where we go live to record the podcast. We also do weekly Monday night live streams on the TikTok as well, where we now have over 40,000 followers. Yay. Go team. Go team. Uh, we also have the Instagram, the X, Twitter if you will. The Discord. We have, of course, the Amazon storefront, the merch store, Monday Night Magic live streams. You can find our Moxfield deck list for said Monday Night live streams. All of those links in the bio. Upcoming releases. We, of course, have just had several releases for Magic and D 
D&D. Mm-hmm. Up, up next, though, we have Fandover and Below. The Shattered Obelisk is going to be coming out next week, September 19th, one week from today as of recording. Plain Chase, or Plain Scape, not Plain Chase. No. Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse October 16th as well as The Book of Many Things November 14th for Magic the Gathering we have the Doctor Who Commander decks coming up in about a month on October 13th Lost Caverns of Ixalan in November uh, not really a specific day I, we need to update that there probably is a specific day by now we have that technology and then of course a second run of Lord of the Rings product early in November on November Third as well. Sam, of course, is Lost tight. Caverns will be arriving on November seventeenth. November seventeenth. Seventeenth. Very good. Consider it noted. Before we move on to the meat, we're going to be talking about one D and D, the playtest seven. Uh, we're basically basically it's a rehash of the fifth playtest with the barbarian, the fighter, the sorcerer, the warlock, and the wizard, returning a lot of things back to five E and streamlining just the basic five E stuff, as well as having some new subclasses with the barbarian's path of the world tree, as well as the fighter's brawler mm-hmm. subclass. We're going to be later talking about, of course, Gen Con card thieves. They have just had their arraignment. A the first canonically autistic character in Dungeons and Dragons, and maybe some Dragon D and D Funko Pops, which is pretty fun. But yeah, we can give him one more shout out. Uh, Icy Games Designs. You can go to a link in our bio. Icy Games Designs. If he does 3D printed deck boxes, his name is Bryce. You can use code DB25. Link in the bio. 25% off, as well as 25% of the profits go to a GoFundMe for his niece who has generalized morphia. The 3D printed deck boxes, highly recommend. Very nice. They're very nice. Got the magnetic lids. They latch together. They're, they got all the cool side panels that you can swap in and out. Uh, you can get this little accessory kit where if you have two boxes, you can get like a little side panel that lets them slide and connect together. And I've got like a big double deck box here for my Joe to the Unifier deck. And I need to get, I need to pull out all my cool legendary creatures as like a cool sideboard of legendary creatures that can swap in and out and all that. Anywho, we got a, we got a big one today. We got a big one. The seventh. Player's Handbook Playtest for 1D&D on Earth Arcana 2023. In it, as we just mentioned, Barbarian Fighter, Sorcerer, Warlock, Wizard. A couple revisions to the spells, a couple weapons revisions. Uh, includes a revised version of the ability score improvement feats, as well as some rules glossary things. We're going to start with the Barbarian. We're not going to go through feature by feature because they're starting to just rehash the same things and a lot of things are just being reverted back to how they were in the Player's Handbook with... A couple of tweaks. For the Barbarian, Danger Sense is being returned to level 2, and it now works even if you have the blinded or deafened condition. One of the biggest changes, though, that I'm super excited about and I want to talk about, Reckless Attack now grants advantage to your strength-based attack rolls until the start of your next turn, meaning an opportunity attack can benefit, as well as subclass features like retaliation. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that they were talking about in their uh, deep dive video that went along with this playtest of aligning reckless attacks timing because it was always off timed where the attack was just on your turn and it ended at the end of your turn but then the advantage on attacks against you would go into the start of your next turn and now puts it in line yeah big fan big fan of that change Primal Knowledge has moved from level 3 to level 2, matching the level of Primal Knowledge in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Instinctive Pounce has been imported from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and is now just a feature you get. Brutal Critical returns to level 9 and it deals just a flat 1d12 extra damage on a crit, and that damage increases at higher level. Brutal Critical is awesome now. Yeah, I mean, it's always been nice to have extra damage, especially since that's kind of what you want as a Barbarian. It's like, ah, big, big hit. Um, but they were saying in the deep dive that, you know, before it was based on your weapons die. So if you wanted to, if you were doing something flavorful with like a D8 sword. Yeah. Sucks. But now, but now it's always going to be a D12. And again, that's going to uh, go up to 3D12 by mm-hmm. max level, I believe. Even if you're using more of the barbarian staple weapons, like obviously the great axe, very popular with barbarian. It's a D12 weapon, but the great sword is 2D6. So Brutal Critical would only give you an extra D6 on that. Yes. Really sucked. But now just a flat D12 and that damage even buffs even further big fan relentless rage returns to level 11 persistent rage returns to level 15 and the unconscious condition not the incapacitated condition shuts off the rage in addition the feature incorporates the function of rage resurgence where you regain a use of rage when you roll initiative 
just a quality of life kind of condensing of features. Indomitable Might returns to level 18 and now applies to strength saving throws and strength checks. And then Primal Champion returns to level 20 and once again increases the scores by four for strength and constitution up to 24. All pretty good. I'm, I'm a big fan of a lot of the re reverting back that they have made here. Um, it feels it, it feels much more like a streamlined, proper, like the Barbarian feels like all their levels now hit mm -hmm. when they get a feature. I also said that when they pointed out that the uh, Persistent Rage um, is shut is now it now has only the unconscious condition uh, shuts off your rage, not the incapacitated condition, mm -hmm. which, of course, there's certain spells that can get, make you incapacitated for like a round. Of course. Um, but so that's a that's a big one there. Uh, and then, of course, we see that they are returning to the uh, level or the um, ca the top level, giving instead of doing the boons, they're giving big things because the boons weren't. Um, the, bo the boons was a cool idea to play with. Did not hit. Yeah, I think I think they should encourage the giving of a boon at milestone levels just as a DM. Mm hmm. I think that's totally fine. Be but encouraging the use of boons is good. But having that big capstone level 20 thing that is special for your character, I like that. I like that they kept that. All right, we're going to run through uh, some changes to subclasses. We have the Path of the Berserker. The only, the only design note that they have here is that Intimidating Presence is now a bonus action rather than an action. Intimidating Presence is the 14th level feature where you, you basically are just causing... Uh, you're, you're basically just causing the frightened condition when you rage. And now it's a bonus action instead of an action, which kind of fucked with the Barbarian's uh, action economy. Yes. Uh, big note, though, the uh, the Frenzy feature doesn't inf still does not inflict exhaustion. That, I think... Thank God. That, I think, <laughs> believe they said it was one of the biggest uh, good things that they saw. And yes. I agree, we agree. Uh, yeah. This Absolutely. game is not built around positive... Uh, positive thing for with a negative benefit with a negative consequence this game is built around make big bad character yeah it's a good thing that we didn't design an entire homebrew supplement around good thing with bad with a drawback yeah totally no one that yeah that totally didn't happen check out our drive through rpg link also in the bio for our homebrew where we have the uh blood magic and hemocraft supplement which still sells like every month we still sell a couple copies of that hell yeah fun fact i check on it every now and again it's pretty cool it's pretty cool and sweet i combined sweet and cool there and said swool Swool. Yeah. Joey Swool. Joey Swool. All right. Path of the Wild Heart. You might recognize that we've never heard of that before. We've never heard of that before. Not once. Nope. Uh, it is just a renamed Path of the Totem Warrior. A uh, lot of changes to the Totem Warrior. The big change is that all of the creatures for all of the levels uh, are different for the features. So each at level, what was that, 3, 6, and 14, you would get the choice of 3 uh, f three features you could choose from mm -hmm. uh, and previously they were all bear, wolf, and eagle uh, and that caused some confusion where people thought if they picked bear for the first one they would have to pick bear for all of them you never had to do that but now all of the creatures are different so there is no confusion yes um, animal speaker formerly known as spirit seeker now has the spellcasting ability specified. It was where you could cast beast sense and speak with animals, but only as rituals and it specifies wisdom, which doesn't really matter, but just kind right. of a niche mechanical thing that could be confusing. Rage of the Wilds, formerly known as Totem Spirit, contains revisions to each option. Bear, this is the big one. Bear no longer grants resistance to all but one damage type. Formerly... It would grant resistance to everything except psychic damage, which was one of the most powerful barbarian, which made it one of the most powerful barbarians, period. Yes. Enabled a lot of cool things, too. Now, it allows you to gain resistance to two damage types of your choice whenever you rage. So you get to pick them every single combat, which, if we're being real, it, most of the time when you know what you're going up against, you're still going to be very powerful and resist most everything. That's true, but at the same time, it does... It does yeah, not that it's no longer a blanket of protection. Now it's a yeah. it's a more uh, tactical choice that the yeah. player has to make. And with regular with the regular rage, you do get resistant or no, you don't. Do you not normally get bludgeoning slashing? You do. You do. Yeah, yeah, you do. But yeah, you other do. other 
types. Yeah, so, that, now, so now you can pick fire and fucking acid, acid or something. Uh, still, you cannot choose force or psychic though. Which that psychic makes, is the same? Force is the force is supposed to be that uh, that non you know it's supposed to be that overall non resistant thing. Yeah. Um, which I'm totally fine with. Yeah, uh, it, it brings it more in line and it makes the other options more appealing. So it gives that is what they're trying to do. Definitely overall is never one they never want to have a a thing that this is a must choose option. So mm-hmm. you know unless you're being a, unless you're being a pretty like pretty conscious of not choosing the best option. Yeah. When you, if you were to have played the totem or now the wild heart, um, the bear formerly was the only option, you know, at first level or at that yeah. at third level. Yeah, uh, and along those lines, I think it's good that you bring that up because all of these subclass features now, whenever you gain a level in the class, you can swap any of them out, which is cool. So at once you make your choice at level three, if say you chose the eagle. And you get to you level up to level four, and you're like, I don't really want the eagle anymore. I want to try the wolf out. You can swap from eagle to wolf. You obviously you can't swap between different levels, mm-hmm. but within that same feature, yeah. you can choose which like sub feature you're you're wanting. Uh, the change to the eagle is that it lets you take both the dash and disengage action when you activate your rage, and it can be done as a bonus action on subsequent turns. Uh, Every turn, getting a bonus action, dash, and disengage on your turns, uh, that's real good. Yeah, that's, I mean... That's a very powerful choice. You're just going to run around. Absolutely. Just, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, it's like uh, the, it's basically the mobile feat. Pretty much, yeah. Ways. Ooh, combining it with the mobile feat? Mm, mm, that's a little fucky. <laughs> I'm into it. And then, of course, the wolf... Uh, the range of the wolf feature increases to 10 feet. Wolf, when your rage was active, allies have advantage on melee attack rolls against any enemies of yours. It was previously within 5 feet, now is within 10 feet. It is basically improved pack tactics. Yes. Aspect of Wilds, formerly called Aspect of the Beast, contains revisions to each option. Elephant, formerly the bear option, now grants proficiency in athletics or the insight skill, granting expertise if you already have that proficiency. Owl, formerly known as the Eagle, now grants proficiency in investigation or perception, granting expertise if you already have that proficiency in spider. Formerly the Wolf, now grants expertise in stealth or survival skill, granting expertise if you do not already have proficiency. The level six is just have some extra proficiencies. Yeah, that's that's pretty consistent across barbarian classes as level six is an out of combat sort of yes. idea. Yes. Keeping up with the out of combat, Nature Speaker, formerly called Spirit Walker, now has spellcasting ability specified. This is what gave you at level 10 commune with nature, and of course, wisdom is the spellcasting ability for that. The last feature that has been changed, Power of the Wilds, formerly Totemic Attunement, contains revisions to each option. Lion, formerly known as Bear, is no longer stopped by immunity to the frightened condition. Uh, when your rage is active, any enemies within five feet of you have disadvantage on attack rolls against targets other than you or another barbarian with this feature. Uh, it, pre- it previously just inflicted the frightened condition, but at this level, you're going to have a lot of things that are immune to conditions. Yes. You can actually use it now. Falcon, formerly Eagle, now also allows a persistent fly speed while your rage is active, provided you aren't wearing any armor. Uh, fly speed equal to your regular speed. It's fucked at any level. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, obviously you're gonna have you're gonna have character your spellcasters been able to fly since level five. Sure, yeah. Level 14's a bit of a delay, but nothing wrong with the fly speed, especially since you can swap it out as you level up. So you can be a little bit more tactical depending on what part of the campaign you're in. Yeah, and barbarians and a lot of martial classes often do have that issue of mobility. Mm-hmm. Oh no, the dragon took off. Well, well, guess I'm here. Yep. <laughs> oh man, that's so frustrating as a melee character. It's like, all right, now they're 30 feet in the air. And there's no more minions to kill. Yeah, we did a one shot one way off top. We did a one shot one time, you, me, and Darren, uh, our buddy Darren, uh, with our friend Salem running. Uh, the, the and the last encounter is a dragon encounter, and uh, you and Darren were both high level. Sp- we were all three high level spellcasters, but I was focused in melee spellcasting. Yeah, you were and hexblade, so weren't you? I was hexblade. I was like hexblade and something else. Mm-hmm. But the dra- Salem kept having the dragon go here, fly over to here, and I had, uh, my whole turn was just like, well, I I can't make it that far, so mm-hmm. I did nothing in that combat. Yeah, it was yeah that was frustrating for you. 
But lastly, Ram, formerly the wolf feature, no longer uses your bonus action, but requires a saving throw. While your rage is active, when you hit a large or smaller creature with a melee attack, it must succeed a strength saving throw, DC 8 plus proficiency plus strength, or have the prone condition. That is a very powerful option. Level four, it basically gives you your free reckless attack without the, the downside. Especially now with the brutal critical mm-hmm. buff. I mean... That's a good time. Uh, I think this is a much more balanced Totem Warrior, now Wild Heart yes. subclass. Uh, I'm totally fine with the debuff to the level 3 bear feature. <laughs> I can see a lot of people not being happy with that, but a lot of people are very... When it comes... D- in my mind, D&D has never been about optimizing characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those people who are about that, okay, I can see where you're going to be upset about that, especially when you have those weird combinations like the... Druid, the Druid and Totem of the Bear Barbarian. Which is still fucking awesome, by the way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm a big fan of that. But, uh, yeah. It's it's good. I, th- I think those are fine changes. The thing is, is you can still do that. You combo. can still do it. It's, it's just, just not as good. It's still good, though. Yeah. It's still totally good. And I think it's great that the other features are getting a buff so that they're all of a more similar power level that warrants picking other options. Yes, I agree. Totally cool with that. And then we come to one of the new subclasses for this uh, playtest. We have Path of the World Tree. We will do a run through of each of these features since they are all new. Level three, you get Vitality. Of course, this is all based on Yggdrasil, uh, sponsor of the Dungeon Bros podcast. Level three, you get Vitality of the Tree. When you act, when you activate your Rage, you regain a number of hit points equal to your Barbarian level. At the start of each of your turns, while your Rage is active, you can choose another creature within 10 feet of yourself to gain temporary hit points. To determine the number of temporary hit points, roll a number of d6s equal to your Rage damage bonus and add them together. If any of these temporary hit points remain when your Rage ends, they vanish. That is interesting. Yeah, we haven't often seen the Barbarian... Where it's uh, it's almost paladin like. Yeah, it's it's very healer. Yes. In vibe, I'm into it, and I like that it's temporary hit points as well. Yeah, I'm. That wouldn't make much sense just to give healing as the barbarian, yeah. but those temporary hit points. I mean, even if you wanted to, you know, straight away from like the magic aspect of it, it's like mm-hmm. ah, they feel empowered by being near your muscly form. Yeah, I mean that's a way. That's a way to do it. <laughs> but it's also the magic of Yggdrasil and the World Tree being healing and protective and all of that. Very thematic. Uh, very, very good tank ability. Mm-hmm. All right. Level six, you have branches of the tree while your rage is active. Whatever creature you can see ends its turn within 20 feet of you, you can use your reaction to summon spectral branches of the world tree around it. The target must succeed a strength saving throw, DC 8 plus proficiency plus strength, or be teleported to an unoccupied space you can see within five feet of yourself or in the nearest unoccupied space you can see. The space the target teleports to must be on a safe surface or liquid that can support it, otherwise the target doesn't teleport. A quick design note, voluntarily failing a saving throw. 2024 Player's Handbook will clarify that any creature can voluntarily fail any saving throw that they so choose. Branches of the World Tree is like, oh, you're running away? No, you don't. Yeah. You're going to stay nice and close to me because I want to fucking murder you. Or it could also be you know, oh, you're in danger, but you ended your turn within 20 feet of me. Yeah. Come over here. I'll stand behind me. I've got this. Yeah, exactly. It, it, I like the design note on failing this voluntarily failing the saving throw is pointing at what they're trying to go for here, where it is both an offensive thing that you can use to benefit yourself uh, in combat, as well as something to protect an ally and get that kind of world tree magic yeah. protection thing. I'm a big fan of that. It's also very thematically cool. Oh yeah, it's definitely cool. Love love the whole the the imagery of the the roots of the tree coming up and doing stuff Just for you. Yeah, very, it's very very hentai, but not nasty. You know right. You know, if they were te- if they're actual tentacles and not just tree roots. Yeah, we're looking we're looking at you. Uh, the the oh my gosh, the warlock subclass, the one that gave you the tentacle. of the depth uh, the depth. Yeah, yeah, that one, that one, the one that gives you the tentacle. You nasty. <laughs> you nasty. Also, that's a really good subclass. Level 10, you get Battering Roots. Tendrils of the World Tree, except... It's tendrils now. It's not roots. Oh. Tendrils of the World Tree extend from your melee weapons. While you wield any melee weapon, your reach with that weapon increases by 10 feet. That is a total of 15 feet on your melee weapon range. That is very good. When you hit with it, you can activate the push or topple property, even if you aren't using another weapon mastery property with that weapon. 
So all your weapons now have the push or topple property, and they all have a range of 15 feet. Yeah. Uh, at level 10, that is probably one of the better level 10 subclass features for a barbarian, period. Knocking them down, pushing them away, and, and being able to hit people farther away, all good. All Noth- very good. Nothing nothing there to, to sneeze at. Ah, chew. I, am, I apologize for that. That was a bad joke. Uh, level 14, travel along the tree. As an action, you can touch a huge or larger tree or a teleportation circle to create a link through the world tree to a teleportation circle somewhere else on the same world or another plane of existence. When you do so, you can specify a target destination in general terms, such as City of Brass on the elemental plane of fire, and you and up to five willing creatures within 30 feet of you will appear at the teleportation circle closest to that destination. If the teleportation circle is too small to hold all the creatures you transported, they appear in an occupied spaces closest to the circle. Once you've used this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. If you've run out of uses of this feature, you can expend five uses of your rage choosing to activate this feature instead of raging. Teleportation. Not something we thought we'd see in a in a barbarian. No, no. At level fourteen, a little bit high level where you're gonna probably not get be getting a ton of usage out of it. Um, it might it, it'll be nice for you to be able to do that instead of your spellcasters so they can save a spell slot. Mm-hmm. Um, but at that point, you've already been teleporting for several levels probably if you have a wizard or a sorcerer or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's still totally fine. What do you think of the path of the world tree? I like the Path of the World Tree. It's a neat little, uh, it's a neat little class, a uh, barbarian class. Um, however, the problem with the barbarian for me still rolls in that it's always very limited of what you can do. Mm-hmm. This does add add some more uh, like tactical positioning, and especially once you get to the tenth level, where it's like, okay, now you're opening up more weapon masteries. Getting reach is very good. Uh, But we were talking earlier about how level 10 is generally when you get that out of combat utility. Mm -hmm. You now don't get that out of combat utility to level 14, and it's out of combat utility that's going to be a lot more niche. It is. Than something as simple as, for example, commune with nature with the uh, wild heart barbarian. So I think it's a good subclass. Um, The out of combat utility is a little bit lacking, but at the end of the day, if you're playing a barbarian, you know what you're here for. Really you do. Yeah. So I'm okay with that. Uh, the last subclass they include is the Path of the Zealot, which was previously in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. They now seem to want to put it into the player's handbook, which we are totally cool with. Yeah. Uh, the Path of the Zealot has four major changes. Divine Fury, the level three feature, now allows you to determine the damage type each time you deal the damage. You get extra damage equal to 1d6 plus your barbarian level. The extra damage is necrotic or radiant, and you choose it every time you deal it. Instead of just having to choose it at the beginning when you pick the subclass. Totally fine. Warrior of the Gods now includes the ability to regain additional HP when healed by a spell or magic item. It's an other level 3 feature. Restores any number of hit points. You can roll a d12. When a spell or magic item restores any number of hit points, you can roll a d12 and regain additional hit points equal to the number rolled. Just some more healing. Yeah. Zealous Presence now allows you to use it multiple times between long rests by expending uses uses of your rage. Zealous Presence is the level 10 feature where you activate it as a bonus action. Up to 10 other creatures of your choice within 60 feet of you gain advantage on attack rolls and saving throws until the start of your next turn. Uh, Once you use it, you you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. If you run out of uses, you can expend a use of your rage instead. So basically just... Group advantage on shit for a round. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, if you watched the campaign two of Critical Role, mm-hmm. this was uh, what Ashley Johnson played. And Zealous Presence is one sh- it's used, I feel, more often than a lot of her uh, abilities. Yes. Partially because she forgets a lot of her abilities, as we all do from time to time. Yes, and uh, the the bonus action nature of it really is, really is good for the Barbarian. I feel like it was an action at one point. Or I might be thinking of her her uh racial feature from the asmr maybe i think that's what i'm thinking Probably. oh the spectral wings yeah yeah yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. yeah yeah okay uh and then finally rage beyond death now turns you into a warrior spirit after you successfully use your relentless rage rage beyond death when your relentless rage successfully restores your hit points you can assume the form of a spectral warrior while in this form, you gain the following benefits. You have a fly speed equal to your speed and can hover. You can move through dif- through creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain, but you take 1d10 force damage if you end your turn inside a creature or object. 
When you are hit by an attack roll, you can use your reaction to turn that hit into a miss. The form lasts for one minute or until you regain any hit points or drop to zero hit points. Once you use this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Previously, Rage Beyond Death was basically just you fight at zero hit points. Yes. Until you fail all three of your saving throws. Uh, this is so much cooler. This is a lot cooler. <laughs> so much cooler. And probably more beneficial. Uh, especially because Relentless Rage is kind of the feature that took the Rage Beyond Death feeling um, and just put it in the base Barbarian now. Yes. So it's kind of a dead feature. So changing it up entirely, giving you a little spirit form is a good time. Final thoughts on the Zealot Barbarian and the Barbarian as a whole, Sam? Um, the Zealot Barbarian... I think that you, they just made a lot of, they just made some good uh, uh, quality of life updates. And I do, and overall, I do like that they're giving now, uh, everything seems to have an ability to be used multiple times by expending uses of rage. Um, I think that is going to be very helpful. Yeah. Because especially like the, um, they were talking about, they were talking a little more about the uh, fighter class, the fighter, but it's still similar. You might only have one combat in a day. Mm. As a barbarian, you're only going to need to rage probably once. Maybe twice. Maybe twice if you, you know, get knocked down. But, you know, get you have... Down, then you get up again. But by, you know, 14th level... Yeah, 14th level, you have five uses of rage. So it's good to have another thing to do with them. I agree. I absolutely agree. Especially with modern D&D moving away from the multiple combats in a day. Uh, they're also trying to empower the short rest a little bit more. They were talking about that in the video, but Barbarian still doesn't really have a ton of things to do with the short rest, which is totally fine. Um, I really like a lot of the balancing changes that they've made. Things, as they have said, the playtests are going to be going back to 5e in a lot of ways. Things are a lot more similar to how they were previously. We can talk about that at the end, whether that's a good thing or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I like that it's going to have more subclasses. I like the subclasses are more on an even field yeah. power level as well. Uh, real quick, just to say, we do have the TikTok chat ready for questions, which we most of them we will answer uh, towards the end. However, there is one related to the Barbarian. Uh, Ember Joe pops in to say that uh, he loves the differences in the rages as well. Okay. Um, we agree. Having, having more utility for the rage outside of combat is like the main thing that will benefit the barbarian whenever they're designing a subclass. Yeah. So the more times that you have a way to use it for something that isn't just raging is very, very good. Much like how the druid, when you have uses for wild shape outside of changing into a creature. Yes. Big fan. All right, moving on to the fighter. Uh, this is probably going to be one of my favorite classes in 1D&D, &D, if I'm being completely honest with you at this point. I'm a big fan of, all, of, what's, of what's going on with the fighter right now. Fighting style. Now lets you replace the feat that you choose whenever you gain a fighter level. This was inspired by martial versatility in Tasha's Cold from Everything. Every time you level up, you can change what your fighting style is. All good things. Second Wind now restores one expended use on a short rest. Uh, second Wind, of course, the bonus action healing, you now get more of it. Yep. And short rest is now a little bit more valuable. Weapon Mastery now maxes out at six mastery options instead of five. Just a straight buff. Action Surge now allows any action except for the magic action, and it once again improves at level 17. The action surge, there was a lot of kickback last time because it very much limited the options that were available to you, when really their only in design intent was, oh, you can't take two levels in fighter to then cast two spells a turn as mm -hmm. a spellcaster. I'm totally fine with that balancing change. Yeah. It, it's Again, that's going to be one of those things where... Some people are going to be very displeased with that based on, you know, powerful builds. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a bit of a debuff to the Eldritch Knight. It's also a big debuff for multiclassing into fighter, but still multiclassing into fighter is one of the best multiclasses you can take in the game anyway. Mm -hmm. S even without even without that ability, it's still really good. Yes. So, and you'll still have plenty of other things you can do besides cast that spell. Yes. Uh, Tactical Mind is a new level 2 feature which allows the fighter to excel in or out of combat. Tactical Mind. You have the mind for tactics and getting the upper hand and on and off the battlefield. When you fail an ability check, you can expend a use of your second wind to push yourself towards success. Rather than regaining hit points, you roll a 1d10 and add the number rolled to the ability check, potentially turning it into a success. If the check still fails, that this use of second wind isn't expended. 
That is a very big buff to the fighter out of combat. And at level two, yeah. nonetheless, these first two levels of fighter, before you even pick your subclass, are so packed with good features. It is very powerful. Yeah, and that's thankfully one of the things we've seen continue from uh, Tasha's, I believe, and beyond, is where if it doesn't work, no worries. Yes. And that's always a big thing is you want to, you want people to be able to do their cool thing, mm-hmm. and it feels it, it feels bad. It's bad feels when... Uh, they can't. They can't. When you use it and it still doesn't work. Yep. We'll get to it later when we get to the spellcasters, but that's also part of what inspired some of the changes to counterspell, mm-hmm. which we'll get into that later. Uh, second wind, I don't know if it was like this. In, I don't think it was like this in 2014. You do just get two uses of the feature now. And then you get one back on a short rest and you get all of them back on a long rest. So you're getting even more, you're not just locked into your one use of second wind. Yes. I'm a big fan of. All right. Fighter subclass and ability score improvements return to their levels in the 2020 or the 2014 version of the player's handbook. So some level adjustments. Tactical shift is a new level five feature that allows you to move without provoking opportunity attacks when you activate your second wind. Tactical shift. Whenever you activate your second win with a bonus action, you can move up to half your speed without provoking opportunity attacks. Just giving the fighter more things for their second win, which like, I mean, I I get it. The definitely that is a big, a big boom because, you know, fighter, obviously the main thing you want to do uh, is attack. You get three, you know, you're the class that gets three attacks at level 20. Uh, but if you attack, attack, and then... Uh, three, I would like to say three extra attacks. Yes, three so extra four attacks. Four total. Um, so it's like you still want to use your turn to attack, but then if you want to heal, well, now you gotta. You might have to, if you want to back out, you might have to take some damage that you just healed. Yes, exactly. So dashing without, without opportunity... I mean, it's basically dash and disengage at the same time. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why they have that distinction. Like, what are, what am I missing it with the disengage? I don't know. Versus dash. I don't thing? know. It seems well. I, well, I guess it would be move up to half your speed. With I, is that? I don't know. Someone smarter than me can figure that out. Anyway, <laughs> Master of Armaments replaces Weapon Expert and Weapon Adept at level nine. This new feature lets you change the mastery properties of all your mastery weapons. Level nine Master of Armaments. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can choose any number of the kinds of mastery weapons you're using and replace the mastery property of each with another mastery property. The chosen kind of the weapon must qualify for the new property. For example, you could replace the longsword sap property with the push property. These property changes apply only for you, not for others, and the changes end when you finish your next long rest. Basically just combining the two features and simplifying the entire process. Indomitable, once again, confers more uses at higher levels. Love that. Sure. Studied Attacks is a new 13th level feature, which increases the likelihood that you'll hit after a miss. You masterfully study your opponents and learn from each attack you make. If you make an attack roll against a creature and miss, you have advantage on your next attack roll against that creature before the end of your next turn. You get the most attacks of any class. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really have easy ways to generate advantage. Now you kind of do. Yeah. Very good feature. Unconquerable has been cut in favor of Indomitable improving at higher levels. Just kind of streamlining. Streamlining. And then, of course, having three extra attacks returns to level 20. Thoughts on the base fighter, Sam? I like the uh, small improvements they've made. And I, I generally, you know, with the last one and this one, the continuation of seeing, like, this is the best weapon person uh previous editions as in the 2014 edition there was no feeling of oh the fighter is a great is a great with all the weapons and all the things no it's just it's a dude who hits things a lot yep now it really is the master of all of the weapons Mm -hmm. which is kind of the whole point that they were going you might even call it the master of the battle oh speaking segue speaking of battle master three updates for the base subclass with a ton of updates for maneuvers we're not going to go through in detail all of them we'll just list them but student of war now also gives you proficiency in a skill bonus proficiencies nothing wrong with that 
It's a level three feature. Know your enemy now also allows you to know a creature's damage, resistances, immunities, and vulnerabilities as a bonus action. Uh, that was like the study, and you can get insight into like their level or yeah. their hit points and stuff. But damage, resistances, immunities, and vulnerabilities are much more useful. Oh, for sure. Much, much more useful. And then Relentless now allows you to use a maneuver once per turn without expending a superiority dice. The free maneuver uses a D8 instead. So just even more uses. That's That was always a thing about the Battlemaster. I just smacked my mic. I'm sorry. Um but uh, that was always the thing about the Battlemaster is their pool is of, of die of maneuver die was very limited, and so it's and you could very easily accidentally go Nova basically. Yeah. Um, and so now getting to fifteenth level, you know, obviously that's top tier play, but once per turn, a free a free use. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're you're really going to be spamming your maneuvers all the time, especially with the ones that can overlap each other. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big spam fans. So, maneuver options. There's a lot of design notes on updates where the details of them aren't super important. If you want to go through them yourself, you can check out the PDF, but we're going to run through them all. Ambush from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is, impro- is included. Bait and Switch from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is included. Commander Strike no longer uses your bonus action. You just get it. Commanding Presence from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is included. The Disarming Strike, Distracting Strike, Goading Attack, Maneuvering Attack, Menacing Attack, and Precision Attack now work with any type of attack roll. Some of them were limited to melee, some of them were limited to ranged. Now it can be any attack, which is pretty cool. Evasive Footwork now lasts until the end of your turn, not when you stop moving. Lunging Attack now lets you take the dash action as a bonus action and adds the superiority die if you hit a creature after moving at least 10 feet in a straight line. Parry now allows you to add your strength or dexterity modifier to the damage reduction. Precision attack now triggers from missing an attack roll, not before you know if the attack hit or not. Rally now uses your choice of intelligence, wisdom, or charisma when determining the amount of temporary hit points gained, and tactical assessment from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is now included. More maneuver options, and the maneuver options are just kind of better across the board. What do you think about the Battlemaster? Battlemaster's always been one of those that I've been interested in playing, but uh, again, with how limited their pool has always been, and with how clunky some of the maneuvers have been in the past, I think mm-hmm. that these improvements are going to be helpful. The Tasha's or the Tasha's maneuvers have been some of my favorites. Um, A lot of them have offered out of combat utility for them as well. As well. Uh, so yeah, all of these things are good. Very good. Uh, The Battlemaster, a lot of people were like, why don't you just put the maneuvers and make that the base uh, class feature for the fighter? Uh, The fighter already had its identity, and now it has an even better identity than it was previously. Mm -hmm. And having, like, a pool of dice resources that you're tracking, that you're spending on specific maneuvers that have individual mechanics is not necessarily a play style that everyone wants to have with a fighter. So I think keeping it to a subclass was still good. And the subclass is better now. Yes. It was already one of the most powerful fighter options, and now it has cemented itself as like one of the premier power gamer options for the fighter, and I'm totally okay with that. We have a new subclass with the Brawler. The Brawler focuses on training and study not in swordplay and battle tactics, but on the skills needed to turn a punch or a kick into a brutal strike and any innocuous object into a deadly weapon. First, at level three, you get two features. You have unarmed expert. You can roll 1d6 plus your strength modifier in place of the normal damage of your unarmed strike. If you aren't holding any weapons or shield, you can make the attack roll the d6. When you make the attack roll, the d6 becomes a d8. So if you literally are just freaking bare knuckle brawling with two fists, d8 instead of a d6, which is pretty cool. Improvised expert you also get at level three. You're proficient with improvised weapons. When you finish a long rest, choose one weapon property from the one-handed list and one from the two-handed list. One-handed, light or thrown, has a range 20 to 60. Two-handed, reach or thrown, with a range of 10 to 30. Till the end of your next long rest, the one-handed choice applies to the one-handed improvised weapons you wield. The two-handed choice applies to the two-handed ones. In addition, whenever you attack with an improvised weapon, you can give one of the following mastery properties for that attack, depending on whether it can be wielded in one or two hands. For one-handed, you can deal. You can use the sap, slow, or vex weapon properties. For two-handed, you can use cleave, push, or topple. Now your improvised weapons actually act more like weapons. Yes. Also, being able to give any two-handed improvised weapon reach. It's pretty good. That's very good. 
I don't know why you'd be throwing your two-handed weapon, but... Because it's fun. It's something. It's, <laughs> it is something. I mean, you pick up a chair, you're going to throw the chair. Ah, that's... You're going to hit him with the chair, and then you're going to chuck it to somebody else. You know, throwing a chair with topple, that sounds like a good time, <laughs> honestly. That sounds like a really good time. You are the, you are the expert of improvised weaponry. It's a brand new play style for a fighter that we haven't seen before, so that's exciting. Level 7, you get Grappling Expert. You can make one unarmed strike as a bonus action. When you use unarmed strike in this way, you must choose Grapple or Shove. In addition, at the start of each of your turns, you can deal 1d6 bludgeoning damage to one creature grappled by you. You flex your muscles so hard <laughs> that it crushes them for 1d6 bludgeoning damage. Pretty much. That's pretty cool. Bonus action, grapple or shove as well. Nothing to sneeze at. Nothing to sneeze at. Ten. Dirty fighting. You have advantage on attack rolls made with improvised weapons and unarmed strikes against a creature grappled by you. Now encouraging the use of that bonus action to... I'll grab them. Yeah. And then you're fucking giving them rib shots at advantage with like a table leg or like the bottle that you took and then broke on the bar and you're just like stabbing them in the side. It just as <laughs> so brutal. Going back to that grappling expert real quick. That is that is you make one arm unarmed as a bonus attack bonus action, not as a bonus action when you make an attack. Yeah. Which is very different from the monk. Yes. Which is martial arts. Yes. Get a bonus action free strike when you make an attack this is just you can do something else you can run up and just and then grapple them yes or you can do other things that i don't know what else you can grapple them and then you can use your action to try and restrain them yeah further you can use your action to slap manacles on them you can use your action to fucking throw them over a cliff yeah a lot of things you can do that are not an attack that unarmed strike does have to use choose between grapple or shove it cannot just be an extra True. knock in the side True. sadly uh, 15, Improvised Specialist. You are a master at making the ordinary deadly. When you hit a creature with an improvised weapon, you can add your proficiency bonus to the damage roll, and the damage die of your two-handed improvised weapons becomes a 1d12. In addition, whenever you attack with an improvised weapon, you can use two mastery properties from the improvised expert instead of one. And then in last, level 18, Unarmed Specialist. Your unarmed strikes improve to a d8, if you aren't holding any weapons or a shield, when you make the attack roll, the d8 becomes a d10. Just increasing the damage die size for your unarmed strikes. A little bit underwhelming for a level 18 feature. Yeah. I would have liked to see that a little bit earlier, but at the same time, you're it's also, a good feature. You're also going to be punching them a lot. You're going to be punching them a lot. You're going to be stabbing them with a the bottle. You're going to be smacking them with a the table leg. You're going to be picking up a rock on the ground and bashing their skull in. Uh, Brawler, what do you think? Brawler, as they pointed out in the uh, in the Wizards play test video, uh, very much the opposite of Battlemaster. Oh yeah. Where Battlemaster's oh, like, yeah. I've studied long and hard. You go over there. It's better that way. Brawler's just like, ha, huh, chair, chair. I love it. I would. I think this is probably if I were to play a fighter uh, next, which I don't have any games lined up right now. I might. <laughs> I might choose this brawler. This is really exciting from a DM perspective, especially if you're one that likes to have terrain and stuff. Oh, yeah. A little, like, set decoration on your battle mats. Uh, now, suddenly, the, the table and chairs now is, like, a big tactical thing for, <laughs> for that fighter. It's a good time. Next, we got the champion. Two main changes, nothing too crazy. Remarkable athlete replaces adaptable victor and moves to level three. It now grants advantage on initiative rolls and strength athletics checks in addition to increasing long jump distance. Uh, this was a clarification for the remarkable athlete from 2014 where people weren't really aware explicitly that it uh, benefited initiative rolls and athletics checks mm -hmm. in addition to the jump distance. Uh, heroic Warrior also gives you heroic advantage at the start of each of your turns in combat. Just every turn, starting at level 10, you can get advantage on something. Yep. Not bad. Not bad. Not too which, shabby. Which also kind of coincides with the main feature of the champion being the improved critical hit range. So... We're big fans. Big fans. Big fans. Big fans. Not a ton of changes. Eldritch Knight has had a couple of changes. Spellcasting contains no school of magic restrictions after level three in the subclass. Moreover, the fighter can now change one cantrip when gaining a level, and the fighter can use an arcane focus. This is just a much more streamlined way of doing these like weird one-third caster subclasses. So much better. 
War Magic now allows you to replace one of your attacks with casting a cantrip, allowing the Eldritch Knight to weave magic into their attacks. Another just general good quality of life improvement. Yeah, I believe we saw this in the Blade Singer in previous yes. in, in previous installments. Uh, and this has been one thing that I know a lot of players have wanted because it makes sense. Yes, as a as a big fan of the Hexblade Warlock, I would love to be able to take advantage of extra attack while also using one of them for Booming Blade, mm-hmm. a wonderful melee cantra, <laughs> something the fighter, uh, the Eldritch Knight fighter, is going to be using a lot of. I can imagine. Boom. And then lastly, improved war magic now allows you to replace two of your attacks with casting a level one or two spell, allowing the Eldritch Knight to further weave magic into their attacks. Replacing two of your attacks, it's like, eh, it's fine. That was, that was but, just... Uh, yeah, I mean, but at the same time, you also have, you know, it's level 18, so you have three, so you still get to make an attack, and then you can yeah. make a, do a level one or two spell. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. Uh, Eldritch Knight, just categorically better. Yes. The fighter overall, the subclasses, categorically better. I'm a very big fan of the fighter right now. Yeah, fighter's in a good place, I think. It is in a... It's probably the best place that it's been in in any of the playtests and compared to 2014. So big, big improvements. Now we come to the sorcerer. Innate sorcery empowers your spells, attack rolls, and saving throw DCs for a limited time generally just buffs yeah just general buffs spell casting returns to using the sorcerer spell list rather than the arcane list they did say that all of the spell casters are now going to have their individual class lists as opposed to group lists again yeah that was a streamline uh attempt that they made that didn't really pay off um yeah. partially because once they made it they're like well then we're going to further restrict it and now you're gonna have to do your own research and so just yeah, yeah, giving all these spell lists, it makes things, honestly, simpler for the player. Is, is that a bit of a debuff for, like, the ranger and the paladin? Yes, but at the same time, it kind of restored a big part of the identity for, like, the wizard that was lost, or mm-hmm. the sorcerer, or the, or the warlock. Having a very specialized list now is just... Each class having a spell list, I think, is the way that it always should have been. I'm glad that they kind of went a different route just to see, but I'm really glad that they're going back. And they did note that the the spellcasting classes that they showed in the last playtest are going to have individual spell uh, class spell lists as well. Uh, also, the Sorcerer list now includes the Sorcerer's Burst and Arcane Eruption spells. We've seen those before, the new Sorcerer-exclusive like cantrips. Yes. Totally fine with them. Font of Magic now long, now no longer requires a bonus action to convert spell slots into sorcery points. You can just do it. That makes sense. Yeah, I, it never should have been a it never should have been a bonus action in the first place. It's just like something that you it's a mind thing. Just do it. It's fine. Meta Magic gives you two options at level two and two more options at level ten and seventeen each, and you can now change one of your options whenever you gain a sorcerer level. Again, just more options, more versatility, all good things. Sorcerer subclass returns to the 2014 level progression for the Sorcerer subclass, with the exception of the level one feature being at level three. So, they're still trying to keep all the classes on the same playing field of getting subclasses. But beyond that, they're not trying to make the exact same level, the same sub like all the subclass features happen at the same level for every class which mm-hmm. i think is totally fine uh, aligning them at level three kind of is a very good thing <clears throat> shut up how dare you how dare you cough while i'm speaking i'm glad you mooted the mic though that was very that was very polite of you mm. i had i not called it out no n- very few people would have been the wiser very few but uh the Getting the subclasses at level one or two for certain for certain classes was very very powerful, mm-hmm. um, and it kind of removed a bit of the identity of the core class. Yeah, and just made it all about the subclass. So having having them at level three, I think, is totally fine. Sorceress vitality is gone. <laughs> Where'd it go? <laughs> I love. I just love the the look of that on the page. It just says sorceress vitality is gone. That's it. And not. We removed it. Not. Not has been. A, is gone. It's gone. Sorceress restoration has moved from level fifteen to level five. Ten if, levels. Yeah, that is a big deal. If you have no sorcery points when you roll initiative, the feature restores a certain number. 
that was a big point that they were saying in the in their video is uh, they that a lot of classes this has been happening because you know you don't want to just not have your cool thing to do. Um, so all of these classes we've we've seen with the bar you know the barbarian the fighter when you finish. Um, or when you start, you know, either finish short rest or when you roll initiative, you're going to get something back to have something to do. Yes. Uh, sorcery Incarnate has moved from level 9 to level 7 and has been redesigned to enhance innate sorcery. And then Arcane Apotheosis has moved to level 20 and been redesigned to enhance innate sorcery. Innate sorcery is a new feature, so we're going to go over that. It's You get it first at level 1 and then it gets enhanced at those other features later. As a bonus action, you can unleash magic within you for one minute during which you gain the following benefits. The spell save DC for your sorcery spells increases by one. You have advantage on attack rolls of sorcery spells that you cast. You can use this feature twice and regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. You basically just assume a sorcerer's form. You go, you go, uh, sicko mode. You, you're going, you're going like Super Saiyan 1. Is that, I don't know, I don't know the levels of Super Saiyan. I never watched Dragon Ball. I didn't watch Dragon Ball either. Shit, that was a bad reference. Ooh. Um, um, yeah, uh, uh, anyway. moving on. Uh, J- uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, something, 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 something. Uh, well, I, I, don't know that, I don't know if that helps either. <laughs> uh, level 7, Sorcery Incarnate. When your innate sorcery feature is active, you can use up to two of your meta magic options on each spell you cast. In addition, if you have no uses of innate sorcery left, you can use it if you spend two sorcery points when you take the bonus action to activate it, giving you more chances to activate it and then multiple uses of meta magic on top of it. Very powerful. Mm-hmm. Level seven. Level 20. When your innate sorcery feature is active, you can use one meta magic option on each of your turns without spending sorcery points on it. Free meta magic at level 20. Gotta love that. Love it. List it. Double it. Pass it on to the next person. Yes. All right. Uh, meta magic options. A few design notes. We're not going to go. Just like the maneuvers, we're not going to go through every single one. You can look at them yourself. Distance spell returns to doubling range. Seeking spell now costs one rather than two. Subtle spell now clarifies that it doesn't remove the material components that have a cost specified in the effect of the spell. And then twin spell has some of its previous multi-targeting functionality, but now within appropriate limits. We will look at twin spell. For one sorcery point, when you cast a spell such as Charm Person or Hold Person that can be cast with a higher level spell slot to target an additional creature, you can spend one sorcery point to increase the spell's effective level by one. Still not as powerful as the original twin spell by a lot. Also, if they're going to word it this way, I would really, really like if they just included a list of spells in the player's handbook that are able to be benefited by this. Because the ones that get upcast to increase the number of targets are limited, and other than going through and seeing them all, yes, it's going to be very difficult to find them. So hopefully we see that when they print the official book, which I think they might have mentioned just offhandedly that, that they did have some plans to do that. Um, but this, this they really wanted to, because the old twin spell was very powerful where it allowed you to basically hold concentration on two spells at once. Yes. Um, that were never intended to be held concentration continuously on two spells at once yeah this however does give you additional options uh so things like uh, charm person and hold person um very powerful spells to upcast great spells to upcast and now you can you can do it sooner yes. you can do it cheaper much cheaper than increasing the spell slot level yes one sorcery point is significantly cheaper than that so we stand here. Uh, sorcerer class overall, I think, generally streamlined, generally improved. I like the innate sorcery change uh, for level one, and I like that the subclasses are now level three. All good. You have any thoughts? No. Just vibes? Just vibes. Okay. There's two subclasses that are featured here. The first one is Draconic Sorcery. Three main changes. Dragon Speech now gives you the Draconic language. I wonder who said that. (laughs) We said that. We said that. (laughs) And while creatures of the dragon type understand your speech, you don't necessarily understand them. I think that's fine. Yeah, that makes... Yeah. We're all good with that. You can't just talk to the wyvern. Yes. I mean, you can talk at it. It can't yeah, talk it back. Can't. Exactly. Exactly. You don't want the you don't want the wyvern to be talking back to you. No. That's that's insulting. They're very they're they're very um. It's very rude, honestly. Like they're very aggressive. Very aggressive. Though. You're like, hey, can we fly? And they're like, fuck you. Oh. <laughs> uh, dragon wings once again allows you to sprout wings without relying on the casting of a spell. 
Totally good. Cool. Glad glad we're going back to giving wings to the dragon subclass. Great. <laughs> Jeez, I can't believe they got rid of that. That was such a dumb idea. Uh, Draconic Presence replaces Draconic Exhalation. The feature is now a bonus action and doesn't require concentration. Dragon Draconic Presence is the level 18 feature. You can ch- As a bonus action, you can spend five sorcery points to draw on the power presence in dragons and exude an aura of awe or fear. Your choice within 60 feet for one minute or until you have the incapacitated condition. Each creature of your choice that starts its turn in this aura must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC or have the charmed condition if you chose awe or the frightened condition if you chose fear until that creature is outside of the aura. 60 feet is a very wide aura. It is. Uh, for five sorcery points that is very expensive but at the same time a again radius Effect, effective radius. You pretty much have the whole battlefield. You can give Next everything. Time. And it, again, it's the level 18 thing. You have uh, how many sorcery points do you have at level 18? Uh, way too fucking many. Probably. Uh, 18. You have 18 sorcery points. You yeah. get some back if you don't have any at the beginning of combat. And that's kind of a thing we've seen with the the, the sorcerer options is you get a little bit of a, a form or in this case an aura um, as your top level thing. Yeah. Uh the sorcery points it's like having additional spell slots mm-hmm. which for for reference five sorcery points in the creating a spell slots table is the effective uh is effectively a third level spell so effectively for a third level spell you are getting a 120 foot wide circle of frightened or charmed that can take out. That can do a lot of. That can do a lot, especially to like, you know, especially if you already have your innate sorcery feature up. Actually, no, those are both. Those are both bonus actions. So if you still have it up, your spell save DC to resist this is even higher. It's probably ridiculous. Very few things are you know that don't have resistances or immunities. Yeah, probably going to be fine. Probably going to be uh, under your spell. Yeah, the problem. The problem is at that level, you are going to have the big bosses that are immune to those features. But but those are the big bosses. They, you know, if it's if totally you're really fine. only facing off against one big boss, Oops, you're, you've got other things to do. Yeah, <laughs> that's totally fine. Uh, Draconic sorcery, better. It's in a good spot. Uh, it's still a little bit underpowered, but I, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. It's much better than it was in 2014. Yeah. I'm totally fine with that. The other subclass is Wild Magic Sorcery. Four main changes have been made. Wild Magic Surge no longer requires DM permission. This has been one of those things that whenever you have yeah. somebody who plays a Wild Magic Sorcery, they're like, how do I make it go off the most? Yes, exactly. Now you just can. Now, No more than once per turn... You can roll a d20 immediately after you cast a sorcerer spell with the spell slot. If you roll a 20, if you roll a 20, roll on the wild magic surge table to create a magical effect. If the magical effect is a spell, it is too wild to be affected by your metamagic, and if it normally requires concentration, it does not require concentration. In this case, the spell lasts for its full duration. So every time you cast a spell, you have a 5% chance of just getting a thing. Mm -hmm. Every single time. Yep. And... It's a can feature. You do not have to if you don't want to for some fucking weird reason. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're choosing, again, if you're choosing the sub, this subclass, it's because you want to use that feature. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tides of Chaos now guaranteed to give you a roll on the Wild Magic Surge table. That's the other level three feature. <laughs> you can uh, manipulate the Tides of Chance and Chaos to give yourself advantage on a D20 test. You must finish a long rest before you can use it again. Immediately after you cast a sorcerer's spell with a spell slot, before you regain the use of this feature, you automatically roll on the wild magic surge table and regain the use of this feature. Again, <laughs> you see you see the pattern here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> choose to give yourself advantage on a d20 test of any kind. Cool. Cast a sorcerer's spell with the spell slot. Roll on the wild magic surge table regain the ability to get advantage on any d20 test again and force a sur- like <laughs> there's a Ooh. this is an engine <laughs> this is this is a this is an this is a powerful engine at level three this is a very powerful engine at level three uh thankfully they thank god they were like you have to use a spell slot like you can't be doing cantrips and getting this shit going thank god but there's still a lot of powerful things you'd be doing 
That is awesome. I I'm a big it. fan of this. I love that. Very big fan of this, especially because it's now level three instead of level one. Yes. Big, big, big improvement. Bend luck now costs one sorcery point instead of two, a straight up benefit. And then wild bombardment, formerly spell bombardment, now allows you to use wild magic surge effect that casts a spell or that replenishes your expended sorcery points. We'll read that. Level 18, Wild Bombardment. Immediately after you cast a sorcerer spell at the spell slot, you can create an effect of your choice from the Wild Magic Surge table, provided the effect casts a spell or restore or restores all your expended sorcery points. Once you use this feature, you can't do so again until you finish 1d4 long rests. It's a little bit interesting. Yeah. I think it's mostly because you can restore all your expended sorcery points and they don't want you to be able to do that every day. But also, you're level 18. Who gives a shit? Right. Let them do the cool thing. Uh, Wild Magic Sorcery. Big improvement. Yeah. <laughs> Big fan. They, that was, the, that's one of the ones that they are like, they listened. They, they heard. Listened. They improved. Not only is the Wild Magic Surge table much, the, the, the Wild Magic Surging much more simplified, you now have a repeatable engine with which you can use it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little bit sad that they didn't include the table in the playtest, but it, they they said it's the exact same as 2014. I can imagine that they would want to change some of the options in there, though. Yeah, give me I, like, f I think I, I think they need to like put out like four tables. Four tables. They all just all wacky different things. Oh my god, that would be so fun. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, like ooh, like setting specific wild yeah. search tables. Oh, that's so fucking cool, right? Oh my god, a Strixhaven specific wild magic search table, and you're doing like weird shit with like books and scrolls and like owls and fucking school theme oh, yeah. shit, or like oh oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> fucking literally write that down because <laughs> that is a fun homebrew. Right? Seriously, where do we have a pen and paper? At the back of these. At the back of the. Oh, we already wrote something on the back of this. I think. What was that? Oh yeah. Hold on. Custom setting. Wild magic tables. Well, he's right, and that I'll just say again, guys. Once uh, we're almost done here with this play test, we're well. We got the uh, warlock and the wizard left. And then we'll go through and hit some questions from the chat. Of course, of course. Next is the warlock. We were not happy with the the previous iteration of the warlock. No, the warlock was one of the one of the I think three classes we were particularly displeased at. Yes, I will say uh, it is improved. They went back to pact magic. Um, it's still a little bit annoying that you only get two spell slots until you're level ten. No, until you're level eleven is when you get three, and then you get four at level seventeen. I think that it should max out at five or six and then get the progression a little bit earlier going with more spell slots, but that's just personal preference. Uh, all right. Weapon or design notes for the Warlock. The class's armor training entry returns to including only light armor. Pact magic returns. Like Batman. Yeah. Eldritch invocations moves to level one. And at level 20, you have 10 invocations rather than eight. Many of the invocations are revised as detailed later in the document. We'll get to that. Pact Boon is integrated into the Eldritch Invocation features. Over time, you are now able to choose more than one of the former Pact Boon options. They got into this in the Design Notes video a little bit, um, where they really felt like the two main ones were Pact of the Tome and Pact of the Blade, because it was like, are you going to be a, a more purely spellcasty focused warlock or like a sword and sorcery focused warlock? Now, uh, you can eventually do both. You can do Pact of the Blade and Pact of the Chain and get a little a little familiar. You oh, can buddy. do Pact of the Tome and, and the fucking Talisman one. So a little bit more customizability and just integrating it into the Eldritch Invocations uh, uh, feature set. Simplifying the Warlock in a lot of ways, but you still get even more customization options with that. Yeah. And getting 10 total instead of 8. Yeah. Again, they they we want more Invocations. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even more. You can you could max it out at fucking 14 or 18 or 20. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be probably a little excessive. Uh, mag <laughs> Magical Cunning is a new level 2 feature that allows the Warlock to quickly regain a certain number of spell slots. Wow. Okay. I knew this was coming. It's fine. Wow. Uh, level 2, Magical Cunning. If all your packed magic spell slots are expended, you can perform an esoteric rite for one minute, at the end of which you regain half of those spell slots rounded up. 
Once you use this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. So effectively, you have an effective number of spell slots that is one and a half times larger than what is listed on the spell list or yeah. listed on the class table. So when you get two spell slots, you effectively have three spell slots per short rest. Per, per, uh, even even more emphasis on getting. Well, it's only the right is only a minute. Sure. As well, yeah. plus it's very thematic for the warlock to be doing weird rituals and shit all the time. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. I like that. I I like that as kind of a workaround of we don't want to give you more spell slots. Right. So you'll still have to do. You'll still only have the few that you have. You know, the two that you have, per three combat. that you have per combat. We can get another one later. We can get another one. I'm okay with that. I still think it would be. I don't know. I don't know. There's plenty of invocations that give you free spell casting as well. So I get it. I get it. I just want... Give me more spell slots. I like spell slots. If you are frustrated like me with the spell slots, you can check out our YouTube video where we talk about using spell points instead of spell slots for a warlock. It's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> Contact Patron moves to level 9. Mystic Arcanum recur returns to being a core feature instead of being tied into the Eldritch Invocations, which I think is also good, mm -hmm. especially now that you have more choices or more slots to put invocations in. So I like having it separate. And it now allows you to replace one of its spells whenever you gain a level in this class. Hexmaster is gone. Eldritch Master returns to level 20. Let's go, to, let's go check out Mystic Arcanum real quick. Level 11. Uh, choose one level six spell. Effectively exactly the same. Cool. All right. All right. Going to take some deep breaths. We're going to run through all the Eldritch Invocation updates. Summary of the main changes since they have appeared in the last Player's Handbook playtest. All right. This is a lot. Agonizing Blast now lets you choose which Warlock Cantrip benefits from the Invocation, so it is no longer just Eldritch Blast. Eldritch Blast. Improvement. Ascendant Step now requires le requires level 5 plus rather than level 9 plus. Beast Speech is gone since Speak with Animals is now on the Warlock spell list and can be cast as a ritual. That's fine. I right, am yeah, do it. Better. Okay. Actually, that's, that's, that's good. That's actually better. That's much better. <laughs> so much better. Uh, Devil Sight now works in dim light as well as in darkness. Eldritch Mind has been imported from Tasha's Culture of Everything. Eldritch Sight is gone since Detect Magic is now on the Warlock spell list and can be cast as a ritual. Again, an improvement. Ooh, my favorite. Eldritch Smite has been imported from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Eldritch Spear now lets you choose which Warlock Cantrip benefits from this invocation, not just Eldritch Blast. Eyes of the Runekeeper has been removed since Copperhand Languages is on the spell list and can be cast as a ritual. Fa uh, favor of the Chainmaster has been cut in favor of importing the investment of the Chainmaster from Tasha's Cauldron and Everything. The better yes. Pact of the Chain improvement. Fiendish Vigor no longer requires you to roll a die when you cast False Life. Instead, you gain the maximum number of temporary hit points. Big buff. Love that. Gaze of Tuned Minds now requires any willing creature, not just any humanoids, and to cast spells from other creatures' space, you must be within 60 feet of each other. Sure. G Gift of the Depths has been imported from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Eldritch Mind from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything replaces the Hexer. Investment of the Chain Master has been imported from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Lessons of the first one can now be taken more than once. Life Drinker now lets you choose to deal necrotic damage, psychic, or radiant damage, and its healing is connected to your hit dice now. Love the incorporation of a hit die. Big Love a hit die. Check out our Blood Magic and Hamacraft supplement if you want to have more uses for your hit dice. Master of Myriad Forms now requires level 5 plus instead of level 15 plus. That is a big change. Oh, yeah. Very big buff. One with Shadows lets you cast Invisibility without a spell slot when you're in Dim Light or Darkness. Very cool. Otherworldly Leap now requires level 2 plus instead of 9. Pact of the Blade, Pact of the Chain, and Pact of the Tome are now invocations. Pact of the Chain includes additional familiar options, and Pact of the Tome now gives you a level 1 spell slot as well. Look at that. Let's fucking go! Into, ooh, I'm into that. Ooh, I'm into that. You can take it and Pact of the Blade. Ooh! Warlock. Okay, Warlock might be my favorite. Fighter and Warlock are my favorite classes now. <laughs> Thirsting Blade returns, and it now improves at level 11. Awesome. Nice. Oh, my God. You get another extra attack. Holy shit. Hold on. <laughs> is that what that is? Is that what? It says it improves. It doesn't fucking say what it does. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. 
Hold on. Standby. Thirsting Blade. Five plus. Packs of the Blade. You gain an extra attack feature for your packed weapon only. With that feature, you can attack twice with this weapon instead of once when you take the attack action on your turn. When you reach level 11... Two extra attacks, baby. Fuck yeah. <laughs> oh my god, I love that. Vision Visions of Distant Realms now requires a level 9 plus rather than 15 plus. And lastly, Whispers of the Grave now requires level 7 plus rather than level 9 plus. Uh... I am a big fan, Sam. What are you? What do you like? What so do you not like? Overall, this is uh, just straight up improvements since things like we've seen a huge amount of drops in level, which Massive obviously are sum. nice because that gives you the chance to actually use those. Since most people aren't gonna play high, those, you know, a fifteen plus level uh, warlock. It's, now you can get Master Mirror Forms at level five. Uh, so it shouldn't have been. It shouldn't. <laughs> Master of Myriad Forms. It's Alter Self. Yeah. Like, you didn't need to wait till level 15 for that. <laughs> and I get it. It's expended without ca- using a spell slot. But still, that's five is perfect. Second, oh, yeah. the, and one of the things that I think is, a, is the best improvement is we see that beach speech is gone. Beast speech is gone. And uh, Eldritch Sight is gone. Yes. Because all those allowed you to do was use a warlock spell slot to cast those spells. Why would you do that? When you could cast them as a ritual if you just had them on this list. Exactly. That is so much better. They've removed so many of the warlock invocations that didn't need to be there, just giving you the spell on on the spell list that you can cast as a ritual, so more spells you can cast for free, plus the warlock should be, like, the ritual caster, Mm -hmm. because, like, that's the whole thing, is, like, setting up the fucking candles and, like, fucking having the bowl of, like, bones and beads and shit and, like, throwing it on the ground, like, oh. Calling your patron daddy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Warlock fucking rocks. This oh, is yeah. great. This is great. This is this is the best iteration of the Warlock. Better than 2014. So much better than it was previously. Agreed. Highly, highly recommend. All right, we're getting to subclasses now. Archfey Patron. Patron spells, formerly called Expanded Spell List, now lets you have its spells always prepared, and it includes Misty Step. Thank the fucking Lord. <laughs> That was so frustrating. It's like, you can have these options to take, but you don't just get them. Like, now you just get them. Now you just get them. And you get Misty Step, which is just a good spell. Steps of the Fae, formerly Fae Presence, now gives you the Misty Step spell and ways to modify it. Oh, all right. Well, let's see. Steps of the Fae. You can cast Misty Step without expending a spell slot a number of times equal to your Charisma modifier, minimum one. Regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Damn. Uh, refreshing step. Immediately after you teleport, one creature you can see within 10 feet of you gains 10, 1d10 temporary hit points. Taunting step. Creatures within 5 feet of your, the space you left must make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC or have disadvantage on attack rolls against creatures other than you until the start of your next turn. That's fucking good. That's super cool. That is very flavorful, too. Misty step has always been one of my favorite spells in D&D. Oh, it's so good. And the fact that... it, 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 it this now starts to allow you to play out that uh, fantasy of being Nightcrawler. Oh my god, yeah. You're getting you're getting five free Misty Steps. when you, If you have a Charisma 20, that's five free Misty Steps a day. Yeah. Plus with all these extra benefits tagged onto them. Oh yeah. That's really cool. Uh, Misty Escape now modifies your Misty Step spell and, expend, and expands your choices from Steps of the Fae. You, let's see. Oh, you can cast Misty Step as a reaction in response to taking damage. Additionally, you can get Disappearing Step. You have the invisible condition at the start of your next turn or until you or until immediately after you make an attack roll or cast a spell, as well as Dreadful Step. Creatures within five feet of your space you left or the space you appear in, your choice, must make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC or take 2d10 psychic damage. Mini mini little thunder step there. Mini thunder step, which, by the way, you probably would want to take thunder step if you have the ability to here. Oh, yeah. This This is very fun. And then finally, Bewitching Magic, formerly Dark Delirium, allows you to cast Misty Step whenever you cast an enchantment or an illusion spell using a spell slot. As part of the same action without <laughs> expending the spell slot. I mean, this is just fun. Mag- Archfey is now fun. Yeah, I'm into it. Yes. Let's go. Um, wow. Big fan. Big fan. Uh, major improvement. Uh, stamp of approval. So much fun. Celestial Patron. 
two main updates. Patron spells, formerly expanded spell list, now that you have the spells always prepared, and then Celestial Resilience now works with Magical Cunning. Just some quality of life improvements. Nothing crazy. Nope. The Celestial Patron, I always felt like it was a little... Like, you kind of needed to be there. It's like the healer warlock. The healer version, yeah. It's the warlock with, like, a little bit of cleric in it. Nothing wrong with that. Warlock splash cleric. Yeah, that's totally fine. Uh, I've always been rather fond of this subclass from Xanathar's. Um, Now it's just better. Yeah. Because you just get the warlock spells, which was, like, the main thing. You just get them now, so that is a big improvement. Which, by the way, at level 3, that gives you Cure Wounds, Flaming Sphere, Guiding Bolt, Lesser Restoration, Light, and Sacred Flame. Some pretty good... For free. Pretty good spells there. For free. For free. (laughs) Oh my god. What is that from? Click? Maybe, yeah. Is that from Click? I I think it might be from... God damn, Adam Sandler. Anyway, so... Wow, that... That was off the rails. Uh, Love it. Great. Back on track. The Fiend Patron, which they were mentioning... uh, had had a lot of lacking, and so they've made some improvements to uh, make this more flavorful and better. Yes, and also making Hurl Through Hell a little bit more reasonable. Chill. <laughs> All right, four main changes. Patron spells, again, updated to reflect the return of pack magic. The spell list is revised, and the free casting is gone in favor of the spell slot recovery and magical cunning. Dark One's Blessing now works when someone else reduces an enemy within 10 feet of you to zero hit points. Dark One's own luck can be used once per roll. Instead of once per turn. Mm. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And then Hurled Through Hell is the big change here. Requires a charisma saving throw before affecting the target, which makes the most sense. (laughs) You could just kind of do it. Yeah. Uh, The damage is now 8d10, and the target has the incapacitated condition while hurling through the lower planes. So let's take a look at Dark One's Blessing real quick. When you reduce an enemy to zero hit points, you gain temporary hit points equal to your spellcasting ability modifier plus your warlock level minimum of one. You also gain this benefit if someone else reduces an enemy within 10 feet of you to zero hit points, which is generally more useful. There are that, that there's an issue with, the, with we've seen across a couple different subclasses usually where it's like when you do a specific kill, yeah, uh, it's very hard to get that feature to pop, especially if, you know, you're not, if you're, if you, they have very few enemies or yeah. the fact that you have a more, maybe more damaging a more DPS uh, character on your team. Oh yeah. So this is nice. Uh, hurl through hell. Target must succeed a charisma saving throw against your spell save DC. The, or the target disappears and hurdles through a nightmarish landscape dealing 8d10 psychic damage. If it is not a fiend, it has the incapacitated condition until the end of your next turn. When it returns to the space it previously occupied or the nearest unoccupied space. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. So you expend a level 5 spell slot to do so again. Cool. Just making it more chill. <laughs> it was always a, a little bit ridiculous that it had to resist when it returned. Yeah, it just kind of happened. <laughs> uh, well, that was uh, that was always a little bit much. All right, the fiend patron, pretty good. It's fine. Yeah, you get all the you get all the free spells is the big thing. Yeah, yeah it's fine. It's great. Big fan. Uh, great old one. Patron spells formerly expanded spell list now has the spells always prepared, and some of the spells have changed. Awaken Mind now lets you create a two-way telepathic connection instead of a one-way telepathic connection. So you're not just yelling at somebody in their mind. They can also yell back. Yes. Psychic Spells is a new level three feature. Psychic Spells, when you cast a Warlock Spells that... When a warlock spell that deals damage, you can change its damage type to psychic. In addition, when you cast a warlock spell that is an enchantment or an illusion, you can do so without verbal or somatic components. A little bit of subtle spell action for your enchantment or illusion things, Illusion. and everything becomes psychic damage. Nice. Big fan. Big fan. Clairvoyant Combatant, formerly Entropic Ward, uses the telepathic bond to impose disadvantage on attack rolls against you and grant advantage on attack rolls against the creature for the duration of the telepathic bond. A little bit of an improvement. Nice. Eldritch Hex is a new level 10 feature. Eldritch Hex, your alien patron grants you a powerful curse. You always have the Hex spell prepared. When you cast Hex and choose an ability, the target also has disadvantage on saving throws of the chosen ability for the duration of the spell. One of the big limitations on the hex spell was ability checks instead of saving throws. Now you can forcibly impose disadvantage on saving throws, not only for spells that you cast, but but for things that will help the party around you. Yep. That is a big tactical advantage at level 10. Oh yeah. The, The world of like, of like team combos 
unlocks. Like you just made, with that, you've made your sorcerer more powerful. You've made your barbarian more powerful. You've made all of you made you made your assassin rogue a lot more powerful. Oh yeah, since now all of these all of these things, you know, I you know, I'm, I I can run up. I can I can do a big attack that's gonna maybe, you know, knock them down. But they're really buff. Can you help me out? Now you can now you can help them out. Yeah, big fan. And finally, create thrall now gives you just the summon aberration spell with some additional properties. So thrall, much better. It's so much more simple. Yeah. Oh. You just get the spell from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. You can modify it so that it does not require concentration. If you do so, the spell's duration becomes one minute for the casting. And when summoned, the aberration has a number of temporary hit points equal to your warlock level plus your charisma modifier. In addition, the first time on each turn, the aberration hits a creature under the effect of your hex. The aberration deals extra psychic damage to the target equal to the bonus damage of that spell. A little bit more of an improvement on your hex much more simple way to summon creatures and they will be sticking around quite a bit longer yes they said they also said that all of the summon spells from tasha's will be will be imported into the 24 or into the updated uh player's handbook yes because those are better they are just they, the summon just spells are. are much better than the conjure i believe yeah they just are they really just are that's it for the warlock sam i can't wait for the hexblade warlock the hexblade subclass. Now, that should have some interesting improvements, especially oh, if they continue to give them along buddy. the lines of what they're doing here, especially with the Fae. Yeah. Uh, they have said that if you are playing with other subclasses from other books, you can simply just move. For the Warlock, subclasses are now at level three. Mm -hmm. They were at level one. Mm -hmm. Just move the level one feature to level three, and then it works. It'll be fine. And it'll work just fine. Be great. Uh, Hexblade Warlock j just got so much more powerful. M most every Warlock. Just got so much more powerful. Oh, yeah. So much more versatility. Big, big, big fan of the Warlock right now. Big fan. Ooh, Hex. Oh, I can't wait to play a Hexblade Warlock again. Take a couple levels of Fighter. Ooh. Ooh. Big time fan. And lastly, the Wizard. Design notes for the Wizard. Arcane Recovery returns to level one. Spellcasting now allows you to change a cantrip whenever you finish a long rest, incorporating the functionality of the cantrip formulas feature from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This feature also returns to using the wizard spell list, and the total number of spells prepared has increased since the last playtest as well. Wizard's spellbook has been absorbed back into the spellcasting feature, just like it was previously. Scholar replaces Academic at level 2, and it offers expertise in one skill chosen from a list. We will not read that. Because that's what it does. Pretty self-explanatory. Pretty self-explanatory. Memorize spell is now a feature rather than a spell and allows you to prepare a spell that you didn't already have prepared. Modify and create spell are gone. They did mention that the reason they got rid of those is it kind of stepped on the toes a lot of the sorcerer, which isn't really what they wanted. Um, I'm kind of sad by that. I think modify spell and create spell could were really fun thematic things for the wizard. Incorporating them into features probably makes it a little bit too crowded. Yeah. On the on the yeah. class feature list. I do think offering some uh, improvements to the memorized spell feature as you get higher levels would be pretty good. Uh, spell mastery returns to level 18. In addition, the chosen spells must have a casting time of an action. No more free shields. Yeah. No more free misty steps. Damn you all to hell. <laughs> Uh, Damn like that, you all. Like they were saying, uh, they've, you know, in their own playtesting, they found that it could be overly powerful. Um, what, getting plus five to your AC as a reaction every turn is too powerful? It's a little, it's a little chunky, you know? A little. Some, suddenly your, your, withers, your wizard's got a thick booty due to that yeah. spell. You can also change one of them whenever you finish a long rest, allowing at will casting of non-action spells such as shield was too powerful. Fuck you. Uh, signature spells returns to level 20. Let's look at memorize spell real quick. Memorize. Level five. Studying your spell book for one minute, you can expend material, mental and magical efforts to memorize a spell. Choose one spell of level one or higher from your spell book that you don't have already have prepared. You can now, you now have that spell prepared until you use this feature to prepare a different spell. It's a bit of a shame. I did really like the modify and create spell spells mm -hmm. from the last playtest. Uh, I would like to see those kinds of features come back in some way for the wizard. Um, I could total spell mastery and signature spells are really good. Is the thing and having class like the main features of the wizard are 
the number of spells you have. Yeah. The like the amount of spell casting you have available to you and your subclass features. So I get why, but at the same time, those are really really fun things you could do. Alas, here we are. Moving on, we have subclasses. Abjurer. Three main changes. Abjuration Savant now adds an abjuration spell to your spell book whenever you gain access to a new level of spell slots in this class. This benefit replaces the rarely used spell yeah. discount. Mm, love it. That that was always a complaint when playing a wizard. It was like, okay, cool. I'll add this in for slightly less. Yes. Now you just get an you extra just get one. It. You just get love an extra it. one every time you get access to a new level of spell. Also, you're an abjurer. Yeah. You're not the school of abjuration. No. <laughs> you you talked a lot of shit about that. Oh, I always hate it. You were never you never could play a necromancer. You were always a school of necromancy wizard. Yep. You made a necromancer wizard, which now it's available online. Yeah. Down drive through RPG. Yeah. But now it's now it's gonna have its own thing. It won't be as good as mine. We'll see. We'll see. I don't think they have it in this. They don't. Uh, Arcane Ward now replaces, now requires you to spend a spell slot to create it, and it allows you to expend a spell slot without casting a spell to restore it. Interesting change. Well, they were saying that, uh, you know, previously it's like, well, I want the ward, but I don't really have a spell I want to cast right now. Yeah. So. so now you just, you just, yeah, it's easy enough. Yeah, you can just use a spell slot to do it, but at the same time, there's plenty. Of, I feel like there were plenty of abjuration spells you could have cast. It's six one half dozen the other. You just get more options. That's fine. It's not a great option. I would rather be casting an abjuration spell and getting it, but in the event that you can't or it doesn't really make sense to, yeah, just do it. And then spellbreaker replaces improved abjuration. Spellbreaker. You always have the dispel magic spell prepared. You can cast it as a bonus action. You can add your proficiency bonus to its ability check. Love it. Big fan. Diviner, my beloved divination wizard. Love the divination wizard. Played one for quite a while. You did. Divination Savant now adds one divination spell to your spell book whenever you gain access to a new level of spell slots in this class. This benefit replaces the rarely used discount. Wonderful. And then the only other change, Third Eye is now a bonus action rather than an action. It allows you to cast the See Invisibility spell instead of having to choose between seeing the invisible or seeing into the ethereal plane. Finally, the incapacitated condition no longer shuts off this feature. Uh, Portent is one of the most powerful uh, features you can get as a wizard. Yeah. It is now delayed to level 3 because it is put in line with subclasses of uh, all the other classes, so everyone gets them at level 3, but that's totally fine. It was yeah. all, It was already an exceptionally powerful an exceptionally powerful feature. For sure. And third eye is just a little bit better. Evoker. Three changes. Evocation Savant. You get a new evocation spell every level instead of the discount. Potent Cantrip moves to level three. This change gives the Evoker a feature that can be enjoyed regularly. I'm a big fan of that. Let the people do their cool thing. Yes. And Sculpt Spell moves to level six. Few spells at lower levels can even benefit of it. At level six, it can benefit many iconic spells. I think that is a fair swap in level there. Absolutely, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Uh, the Illusionist. The Illusionist. Is the last subclass. Illusion Savant, you get illusion spells instead of the discount. Malleable Illusions is now a bonus action rather than an action, thank the Lord. Illusory Self can be reused by expending a spell slot of, two, of level two or higher. More versatility, more uses. Illusory reality has been clarified, noting that it can't deal damage or give any conditions. It, that's just that's just a niche rules clarification thing. Not a yes. big deal. Uh, the illusionist, effectively the same, a little bit better. It was already a pretty good subclass. Yeah. I, I think that the biggest improvement overall have been these savant. savant yes. Uh, upgrades. I just agree. straightforward. And, uh, yeah, not as dumb. Not as dumb. Uh, that is the wizard overall. What are your final thoughts? They're still wizardy. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of the classes overall? I think that, I think now that we're reverting back to more of the players, the original player's handbook, things are falling into place a lot better than they were. Yeah. I mean, I get that they, at the first, you know, the first couple play tests, they really wanted to push the limits. They really wanted to see what people would want to do, what people thought was cool, what people thought was bad. But again, you know, as it's been said, this isn't really supposed to be a new edition, yeah. um, even though it kind of has the the chops of a new edition. They, if they had chosen to call this sixth edition or five point five, I don't think anyone would bat an eye. Yeah, 
but now as we see they're reverting a lot back to the 2014 edition with improvement as stated i think that is just dandy yeah i really wish they would just call it 5.5 though it's so much easier that'd be great so much easier all right we got a couple of spell updates as we mentioned previously arcane divine and primal spell lists are gone all spell casting classes return to having their own spell lists we are in favor of this Arcane Eruption was the new uh, Sorcerer 4th level evocation spell. Uh, It now requires a dexterity saving throw rather than a constitution saving throw. The big change here is Counterspell. Mm -hmm. Counterspell now requires the target to make a saving throw rather instead of requiring the caster to make an ability check. The spell's previous design failed to account for the capabilities of the target, which is now rectified in the new design. The new design also specifies that the countered spell must be cast with spell components, and if the countered spell used a spell slot, the spell slot is not expended. For the specific wording. Casting time, reaction, which you take when you see a creature within 60 feet of yourself casting a spell with verbal, somatic, or material components. So anyone using subtle spell can no longer be countered. Mm-hmm. You attempt to interrupt a creature in the process of casting a spell. The creature must make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save, the spell dissipates with no effect, and the action, bonus action, or reaction used to cast it is wasted. If that spell was cast with a spell slot, the slot is not expended. No benefit to upcasting is now not based on the level of the spell being cast, so it is removed itself, because it was basically just on-demand dispel magic. Yes. Now, the spell magic and counterspell work very differently. This is a debuff for counterspell. It is a debuff for counterspell, but at the same time, like we were saying, it is an understandable and uh, um, honestly reasonable, very reasonable debuff. Um, yeah, I mean, being starting at level five previously, you would be able, you would have a very good chance of countering uh, a lich. Yes, you'd be have a very good chance of countering a level twenty spell. With their one, their not one ninth level spell slot, and then they're just fucked for the day for that. It didn't make sense. No, I will also say now this, uh, obviously this just delays probably what they're going to do a turn. Uh, but that can, in one turn a lot can change during combat. Mm-hmm. But also now, as a DM, this feels a lot less bad to do yeah. to players. Oh yeah, now. Now, as a DM, you can really be like, yeah, fuck your spell casting. How about that? You've been doing it to me now for however many months, Mr. Wizard Man. F- uh, fuck your... Um, chicken strips. Uh, fuck your chicken... Ch- fuck your arcane eruption. Fuck your fireball. Fuck your hex. Fuck all of it. Yeah. The big fan. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm a big fan. I'm okay with this change. Yeah, I think this is an acceptable change. This is reasonable. And again, it's it not it hasn't taken all of its uses use and abilities away. It's still a very powerful thing to do. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Eldritch Blast and Hex have reverted to their 2014 versions. I think that is good. Jump is now a bonus action. Its target must be willing. It benefits no it, the benefit no longer relies on your speed or strength, and it can be improved at higher levels. Jump, bonus action, lasts for one minute without concentration. Touch a willing creature once on each of its turns until the spell ends. That creature can jump up to 30 feet by spending only 10 feet of movement. So much better. Before it took into no account, it was said basically if you jump, you can't jump farther than you could normally, you know, move. Yeah. And so, like, you know, you could have a character that, like, only can move 25 feet because they have the legs. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> they didn't do triple that. tripled their jump distance, but you didn't have the movement speed to take advantage of all of that extra yeah. distance. Now. You just move. You get ten extra. You get you get twenty extra feet, basically. Yes. And that can be up. And lastly, Sorceress Burst now uses a D8 for damage rather than a D6. That was the new Sorcerer exclusive cantrip. Now a D8 of a damage type of your type of your choice instead of a D6. All good. Cool. Got uh, no real feat updates, but they did make a note about bonus feats at level twenty. Uh, they. They do want, they're being like, hey, hand out free feats and free boons and stuff, since they removed all the epic boons from the level 20 features. Weapons. A couple design note changes. The heavy property has been redesigned. Rather than being based on size, it's based on your strength or dexterity score. The flex property is gone. The push property now works on any creature that is large or smaller, and it requires you to push the target straight away from yourself, instead of being able to push them straight up in the air. 
Woo! <laughs> the sap property now works with weapons that have the versatile property or no property at all. The quarterstaff now has the topple property. The spear now has the sap property. The longsword now has the sap property. The warhammer now has the push property. And the warpick now has the sap property. No longer do we have the flex property that is totally fine. And then they just changed what the base properties of these weapons are. Yep. The big thing with the heavy weapon, uh, the heavy weapon is unwieldy compared to other types of weapons. You have disadvantage on attack rolls with a heavy weapon if it's a melee weapon and your strength score is not at least 13. And if it's a ranged weapon and your dexterity score is not at least a 13. That's fine. Cool. Much simpler. Makes a lot more sense. Those are the big changes that have been made. I do. Uh, let's double check the rules. Has there been any design note, rules, glossary update? Uh, the section on death saving throws has been removed. That's it. That's okay. Fine. All right. So that's the seventh play test for 1D&D. Final thoughts, Sam. I think that we've seen a lot of improvements and a lot of things that we were uh, really scared about. Scared is maybe not the right word, but a lot of things we were very unhappy with in the previous uh, editions. They have listened. They have improved. And again, that the reverting back to the fifth edition style of things in a lot of cases yeah. is beneficial to you. I think it is. I think it is for for the benefit of the player this is all of these are improvements yes all of these are better uh if the if they go this route i think one dnd is going to be in a good spot i think it's gonna be a real good spot yeah all right well we've got three little wrap-up items i'm gonna allot myself one minute each here we go gen con <laughs> gen con magic the gathering card thieves are charged with felony theft two men who allegedly stole three hundred thousand dollars worth of magic the gathering cards from an indiana retailer setting up at a tabletop convention at gen con have been charged with felony theft according to the marion county prosecutor's office thomas dunbar and andrew giaum g-i-a-u-m-e i don't know what the fuck you want me to do with that i don't know what they want me to do with that. it's just a name both of them created a game called Castle Assault and have been charged with felony theft for their parts in the alleged theft of Magic the Gathering cards from retailer and tournament organizer Pastime Comics and Games. Should Dunbar and Jaum, Jaum, I don't know, be found guilty, they face up to they face one to six years in prison and up to a $10,000 fine. The Marion County Prosecutor's Office said the charges come after an investigation the spanning <laughs> investigation spanning both Indiana and New York where Dunbar and Jaum reside. Are we surprised? No. They had they had their work shirts on. They were on camera. It was a dumb thing to do. May justice be served. Next. Dungeons and Dragons introduced its first canonically autistic character. I want to reiterate something here. Actually, we'll get into this. Wizards of the Coast is closing out the 10-year run, blah, 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 blah. While Fandelver and Below, the Shattered Obelisk, and Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse represent traditional world-spanning Splat books. The company's October releases is something new for Wizards. A singular product based on a story. Oh my gosh. The Deck of Many Things. There we go. The Book of Many Things. Jesus fucking Christ. Asteria is described as a princess turned paladin. And like Xanathar, Xanathar, Morning Canyon, Tasha, and Tasha, Asteria chimes in throughout the book with commentary, jokes, and other little flourishes meant to make it fun to read on its own. But what makes it different is that she is the first canonically autistic character to be added to D&D. Very well done. Inclusiveness. Characters with interesting uh, backgrounds and stuff. Right on. Uh, the reason I wanted to bring this up is that the headline. Dungeons and Dragons introduces its first canonically autistic character. That word canonically is doing a lot of heavy lifting right here. Yeah, people tend to play characters that are very close to themselves. And we uh, know through social media, uh, especially that uh, it is very popular with people who have a uh, diagnosis of autism, ADHD, and other things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, this oh. is obviously not the first time that we will we'll ever be seeing an autistic character because, you know, we have friends who we've played with. Oh, well, they've, they've, they've played some very autistic characters, um, both explicitly and implicitly. So, but yeah, so canonically, the first canonically. time it's being printed, and we, we hope to God that wizards uh definitely that did all tact. their had their tact tact that tact they were race. paying attention to their uh consultants for this one yeah um they've ha they've had a lot of consultants recently they tact tact also also you look you look at a lot of npcs from previous books there's a lot there's a lot of tism there i also there's a good amount of tism in some of these characters this also be pointed out in the dimension 20 uh uh mm -hmm. 
Fantasy High Season 2, uh, Brennan did have a, a NPC that was canonically autistic. Yes. So, yeah. so take that, Wizards. Brennan yeah. Lee Mulligan's way ahead of you. Yeah. In a surprise to literally nobody. Right. And lastly, Dungeons & Dragons Funko Pops add three pa- has a three-pack and a super size exclusive. You get a three-pack that has Vecna, Mind Flare, Demigorgon. It's a GameStop exclusive. It's a three-pack. It's Dungeons & Dragons Funko. And then, of course, Bahamut the Dragon. In the like platinum the, dragon in one of the big ones the three pack the three pack is twenty five dollars the or sorry the three pack is forty dollars the Bahamut is twenty five both of them available on GameStop anyway that's all we got for the news and the wrap up I'm going to do another quick run through while Sam looks through the TikTok live chat we record this every other week live on TikTok Tuesdays at 12 ish p.m. Eastern Standard Time of course you can find the podcast on Apple Google Spotify YouTube Music uh, Pandora, microwave ovens, uh, regular ovens that are fancier, the fridges that have little the, that have the little fronts that like can go clear, and then they have like little monitors in them. They go clear so you can look on the inside, and they got the little they got the little screens on them. Probably you can get it on that. Uh, we also have forty thousand followers on TikTok. You guys are amazing. Uh, we do it every other week live on TikTok. I already said that. Instagram, YouTube, uh, YouTube. We post the video the video podcast. It's the, exactly the same. We don't have our faces on screen. Don't worry. Discord, Amazon Store, all the, all the shit. Sam. Bottle of Magic asks, do you put NPCs in your games that are queer in any way? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> we, we, I, yeah. I guess, I mean, looking at us, we are two, uh, we are two, two white, very white straight men. Um, straight however, men. we have plenty of friends that are queer and, uh, yep. yeah, we've also, it's just more, in, it's boring if everybody's like straight and straight yeah like it's just boring <laughs> and also there's so much so many instances where you know it doesn't necessarily make sense when you're talking about having multiple races or species or whatever you want to yeah. call them of yeah. of being in the world so anyway the in, in the in the universe of dungeons and dragons where you have dragon people and people and elf people and gnome people and halfling people and orc people and 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 of just all of the like legal drinking ages and different laws for every single race in existence. So if you're especially if you have a character in your party that's like a more rare race, like an ASMR, something that's not as common in the world, you can have him walk in and they'd be like, How can I help? Oh, all right, hold on. And then he slams the book down and he flips through and he's like, ASMR, ASMR, ASMR. How old are you? <laughs> All right, you're good. And then he slams the book shut and, like, all the dust goes everywhere. That's a hilarious idea. Highly recommend. Uh, Robbie Parker, what is the first thing a beginner needs to read? Front and... Well, it says front and back. I assume you... uh, Cover to cover. Cover to cover or... Yeah. Lord Um, of the Rings. Um, That's not related to D&D in any way. You also don't need to read the D&D books. Cover to cover. Just read what you need to know. Yeah. um, And then be nice and know your stuff. Yes. Know what know what your things do, and if you need help with what they do, know at least somewhat what they do. Like if you need if you need help with the jumping rules, everybody needs help with the jumping rules. That's fine. You can ask for help with the jumping rules. But if you're a fighter and you don't know what action surge does, you kind of need to know what your shit does. Don't be the spellcaster that says I cast darkness, and then you look up what darkness does. Yeah. Just saying. Reading reading the features, reading the spells, explains the features and spells. Much like in Magic the Gathering, where reading the card explains the card. But not always. But not always. Uh-huh. Except for the times that it doesn't. I am skipping a lot of questions here, as there are a lot that we have either answered in past previous uh, uh, editions of this podcast, which we highly recommend you go listen to to find answers to, yeah. some, to some of those there's, questions. There's, we're very close to 50 of them now been doing this for well over a year almost two years now mm-hmm. almost two years it's a big deal uh john carcel does have a good question though he says my my elbows are too pointy could i still play yep mm-hmm. absolutely uh, they're really good they're really good if you're sitting next to someone that's bothering you a little bit you can give them a quick jab right to the side 
<laughs> you got a pointy chin, though. You got to play an evil character. That's just how it is. I don't make the rules. We just follow. Um, I'm also skipping a lot of rules questions. I'm sorry, guys. I also have to get back to work. I am. I am no longer on my lunch break. You haven't been on your lunch break for a while. That's fine. Hello, camouflage. Hello. One of the normals of the Dungeon Pros lives. Well, I think yeah. We've got, been going for almost two hours. We're we're gonna cut this short, guys. Thank you for the questions again. We're sorry we couldn't answer a lot of them today, but uh, we are running short on time. Yes. So, of course, this has been the 49th episode of the Dungeon Bros podcast. Playtest survey goes up September 21st. One week's time. Get ready. Get ready. Get set. That's all. That's the main way that they that you can make your opinion heard. On the one D and D playtest, um, this has been a good time. Yeah. Enjoy, the, enjoy your next two weeks. Next episode is episode fifty. Big, big episode. Big episode. Big milestone for us. Very proud of us. Very well done. But we can we can we can we can pat ourselves on the back and stroke our egos more next time. And in and the you best believe me. Yeah, and we'll do that. Oh, I will. I will stroke my ego. All right. Well, with that, in the meantime, guys, peace. <laughs>